Hello, everyone. My name is Erica Wall, and I am the director of the Lunder Institute for American Art at the Colby College Museum of Art in Maine. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our second panel discussion. And I wanted to start by basically saying how excited I am to be here and to uh, witness what is the first of six programs that will launch Lender Institute at. Uh, Lender Institute for American Art is for all intents and purposes a think tank for the museum and for the uh, American art field, but it is also a compass. And these sorts of programs provide not just one direction, but many directions that we can take when we explore American art. And part of that exploration and to sustain that exploration for practitioners within the field is to have these conversations. So I really wanted to take a moment to thank the De Young Museum for being in conversation with the Lender Institute for American Art. I want I wanted to specifically thank Tom Campbell, its director, and its amazing staff and program partners, starting with Sheila Presley, Devin Malone, Abram Jackson, and Maria Equivila. And I also wanted to say that it is my utmost pleasure to be here and to partner, but most importantly, to express my gratitude to Paula and Peter Lender and the Lender Foundation for making the Lender Institute for American Art possible. It is a unique platform that builds communities and benefits not just the Colby College community, but as we see here today, the experience, the discourse, and the practice of American art throughout the country and beyond. So join me in partaking in this wonderful program this afternoon, and I'm gonna hand it over to Devin Malone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devin Malone, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Before we dig into this afternoon's conversation, I want to first thank you all for joining us, as well as thank the Lunder Institute for American Art and Colby College for supporting this program. As you may have noticed, this conversation is about creativity and defiance in American art. The creativity part is a bit straightforward, but defiance is less so. I invited American, Rashad, and Diedrich to participate in this discussion because I believe their practices tackle defiance in so many ways, whether that is defying categorization, challenging institutional authority, or disrupting the archetype of the so-called American artist. The overarching title of today's program, Making America, Conversations on Creative Work and Freedom of Expression, is a launching point for attempting to wrestle with the idea of America as something made, and therefore unmakeable, and the role we may play as artists, arts administrators, and other creative people in giving shape to a new imaginary, perhaps within, but ideally beyond, what we currently call America. We likely will not dismantle the project of US empire over the next hour, but we can certainly explore how artists do the miraculous work of imagining otherwise every single day. Once again, before sharing more about our speakers, I want to thank the public programs team, Maria Eguaville, Rocio Garcia, and Rosario Sotelo for brilliantly helping bring this program to fruition as well as our friends in AV, Visitor Experience, and across the museums for their support today and every day. Now, to share more about our speakers, and bear with me, because there's quite a bit to say. <laughs> Rashad Newsom works at the intersection of art, film, performance, music, technology, and community organizing. Rashad's work has been exhibited at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Park Avenue Armory, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, New York City, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Washington, DC, Center George Pompidou, Paris, and Hayward Gallery, London. Awards received include the 2023 ITVS Documentary Film Funding, the 2022 Pre Ars Electronica Golden Nika Award, a 2021 Knights Arts and Tech Fellowship, and a 2020-2022 Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence Artist Residency, and the 2017 Pollock Krasner Foundation Award. 
American artist, makes thought experiments that mine the history of technology, race, and knowledge production, beginning with their legal name change in 2013. Their artwork primarily takes the form of sculpture, software, and video, and it has been featured in the New York Times, Cultured, Art Forum, and Art in America. They have exhibited at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Kunsthalle Basel, Switzerland, and Nam June Pike Art Center, Seoul. Diedrich Brackens explores the intersections of identity and sociopolitical issues by creating hand-woven tapestries that re-examine allegory and narrative through material, autobiography, and the broader themes of African-American and queer identity, American history, and memory. Brackens' recent solo shows include his first European show at Kessner Gesellschaft, Germany, as well as shows at the Mint Museum, North Carolina, Craft Contemporary, Los Angeles, Blanton Museum of Art, Texas, Oakville Galleries, Canada, and the New Museum, New York. He is a recipient of the U.S. Artist Fellowship 2021, Louis Tiffany Comfort Grant 2019, Marciano Artadia Award 2019, Textile Society of America's Branford Elliott Award for Excellence in Fiber Art 2018, and the Studio Museum in Harlem's Joyce Alexander Wien Prize 2018. Please give this incredible group of artists a round of applause as they join me on stage. All right, thank you all so much for joining me. Um, so before we launch into talking a bit deeper about the topic at hand, I invite each of you to introduce your practices a bit. So we'll start with Rashad, and then we'll go to Diedrich, and then we'll go to American. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I think my work, uh, it looks at the relationships between the Black American experience, uh, improvisation, collage, technology and performance and sort of considers how I can combine these different things to, well, to combine these various creative modalities to create work that uh, interrogates, celebrates, and also abstracts the immaterial and material expressivity um, inherent to black American life. And when I say uh, immaterial expressivity, what I mean is the type of um, expressivity that's not bound to objects, but the kind that lives in your nervous system. And so the way we communicate, the way we dance, the way we talk, uh, yeah. Beautiful. I can pass it over to Diedrich. So many beautiful images. <laughs> um, so I, textile person. I make large-scale tapestries, um, often and lately figurative, but also using abstraction. Um, I'm often mining uh, textile histories, particularly thinking about African-American quilting. I'm thinking about West African strip weaving practices and European tapestry and trying to create something that speaks in all three of these languages simultaneously um, and taking these kind of historical events as well as um, things that might be real and imagined around historical events and trying to extrapolate something new or interesting, liberatory, um, while thinking th through the medium and using the, the tools that are sort of inherent and special about textiles, particularly the kind of tactility, the ability to tell a story without language, um, and thinking about how it, it's a, a substance, a material that we all sort of understand on a, a physical, lived level. Sweet. <laughs> and we'll dig into some of this a little bit more later. Hey, thank you for having me as well. Um, so I, I just included some images of a couple of projects. Um, one is this um, 
surveillance installation at the Guggenheim. This is a reference image of this panopticon architecture, but this is the installation. Um, and a lot of my work is kind of thinking about social and political histories and um, how to sort of, I want to say, like, make people sort of aware of how they're implicated in certain systems or how um, they're present across different aspects of society, um, such as thinking about how things such as like, like carceral infrastructure is present in the university, the library, the courthouse. Um, the museum. The museum as well. And so that's kind of what this project was about. So a lot of it is about like trying to make these connections about how um, these sy systematically violent things are kind of like present in many aspects of our lives. Um, and this second project is part of an ongoing project I'm doing around Octavia Butler, um, who grew up where I grew up in Southern California, and been thinking about a lot of the same issues, but through this lens of her science fiction writing as well as like her lived experience. And we could do the video later if, if it makes sense. But we can totally watch it now if you want. We don't have to watch it. Right okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sweet. Well. Is a people need to Look revive our nation's faith on accident in God. No context. It is now more than ever that we need to focus on the here and now. Our people need to be uplifted. We need to know what's going on on the ground. The space program that drove so many of our pioneers to outer space is something we can no longer afford to do. While so many of us here, breathing, living, building on Earth. Our need of saving. The past the past. We're focused on the future. This is the update. We are the update. That's all we need to do as a species is to update together. We plan to create millions of jobs across education, fashion, communication, computers, and science. Hard working Americans who have been left behind by the private economy and tax break for the rich will finally have the opportunities they deserve to get their dignity back, to take care of their family. That's not just my plan, that's God's plan. I can see a hundred years into the future, and I will be the one to bring that future here to the present. You should trust me more than anyone else, more than Elon, more than Jobs, or any politician. What politician do you know is an engineer? As a black man in America, I understand this country in many ways, some never will. What black president has come to your neighborhood? I've seen things, done things, only God can see. I've been tested, put through the fire more than once. So I know what it takes to make it through the war by Obama, the Space Force by Trump, the epidemic unleashed by Biden. That wasn't on God's time. They can't get rid of us. By following faith, we'll be the type of nation, the type of people God intended us to be. I am Christopher Donner, and I approve of this message. <laughs> you wanna share a bit about that word? Yeah. <laughs> So the, the reason I chose to share that, um, so this is a video that's based off of this character in Octavia Butler's novel, Parable of the Sower. Um, this presidential candidate who, we don't really hear a clear description of you know, what he looks like or anything, but more so his politics. He's extremely anti-space or space colonization. Um, he wants the resource to be here on Earth. Um, he's kind of, a little conservative, but also very populist for the people. And I was thinking about, you know, certain people that are real people we're living with now that are kind of embodying some of these characteristics. I was thinking about Kanye West. I was thinking <laughs> about Chris Smalls, who led the Amazon Labor Union. And so kind of trying to find a way to depict this character that felt like it was already being represented in this moment. Um, and the book takes place in 2024. Yep. So it it feels like very timely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right, so let's jump in. 
And I think that piece is actually a great launching point for this question. So what do you consider the distinct characteristics of American art in the year 2024? And when you talk about American art, what do those words mean to or for you? Take your time. Go for it. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to answer because you were. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 American artist, so I, you were I mean, you would think American would answer first, yeah. but totally I, I whoever just, can jump it. Okay. Well, I, I will say, um, for me, what I like, my answer to that question would be when I think about American art, I think about how embedded, um, you know, because art is about creativity, it's about exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about how embedded that gesture is in black American life. Absolutely. I think the most American thing is the black American. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when we came here, the very idea of being black, we didn't choose that. It was a word that was given to us. We had to create what that was, define that, had to define, you know, create black culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, you know, the idea of, of being black American is about endless creativity. And so I, that's what I think. When I think about um, American artists, I actually think about any number of young black girls, maybe your, com your complexion, <laughs> in a really nice blonde lace front <laughs> with nails that look like they're from Asia and blue contacts and <laughs> just someone who's playing with all the... Um, creative colors in the coloring box because they're not bound by any like sort of cultural specificity mm -hmm. that that's what comes to mind for me yeah thank you for that yeah i mean to ex expand on that i feel like there's um I, don't, I think i always started collage as being something that to me feels quite american that mm. if i think about what's grown out of a collage practice right like the interdisciplinary artist the, the person who um works in many different modes or is bringing in um a critique of the recent past into their work i think is a quite american thing to do um giving voice to something that 50 years ago might not have had space or room um, yeah. Thank you. I don't know if it's exclusively American, but definitely feels of this moment. Um, and maybe something I'm observing from the context of being a working artist in America, but kind of the the breadth of types of work that are able to like hold space simultaneously in a way that sometimes makes my skin crawl. Like, you know, work that is just extremely, you know, like like commercially valuable, mm -hmm. like decorative or, you know, has clear associations with, you know, um, like money that we wouldn't necessarily want to associate with. And then at the same time, it's like right next to some really critical political work where someone's making work about like, you know, fighting for their life, you right. know, and living through that. Um, and that's the only avenue to talk about it. And it's like all those things on the same wall. Um, <clears throat> and I feel like that's sort of exemplary of this moment and kind of like the history of art, because at least the way, you know, you observe it historically, like it always seems like there's, you know, these periods of things happening right now. It kind of feels like everything happens all the time, which I feel like is really of the moment. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was thinking about um, your, I was thinking, I'm thinking about your installation at, I think it was Red Cat, um, and just making unsellable things, not unsellable things, but things that are not like easily consumed by the art market. Um, and yeah, I think that juxtaposition is really interesting that you're calling out there with like the, the sort of very much I'm fighting for my life sort of work. And then there's like, I won't name names, but more palatable work, you know? Um, so thanks for calling attention to that. 
Um, so the language describing this program talks a lot about freedom of expression, that kind of thing. And I actually think what Rashad just said about like these sort of categories that black Americans did not consent to, like um, in the, when they were, when we were <laughs> brought to this country. Um, and I'm just wondering about the idea of the artist as truth teller and whether or not that is a category that, um, and a responsibility that you claim and consent to. Um, Cause I think there is a lot that is applied to someone who is a black American artist. Um, that may or may not be things we identify with, right? So I'd love for each of you to reflect on that a little bit. Yeah, that question kind of threw me. <laughs> and it make yeah, when you when you sent it and it actually makes me want to pull up notes because I've been I'm, you know, working on an exhibition right now. Um, Mike. At, oh, I'm working on the exhibit on an exhibition right now at uh, the Sainsbury Center in Norwich. Uh, UK and one of the questions for that show is what is truth and so I've been really thinking about mm. this whole idea of truth um, and so um, I think first we have to define truth and so I was thinking about you know how uh, Theodore Androino says that the condition of truth mm -hmm. is to allow suffering to speak you know which sort of gives it an existential emphasis so we can see truth as a way of life and not as a set of propositions that correspond with a set of things in the world. And so I connect with that idea but then, of truth, but then I also connect with um, Foucault and Nietzsche's idea of truth, which um, you know, they often say truth is historically uh, part of or embedded within a given power structure. Therefore, it shifts through various epistemologies throughout history. And so in my work, I'm trying to develop a formation of attention that kind of sits between those two ideas of truth. And so I would say the way it manifests in my work is, like for instance, you have the Being the Digital Griot app, which is made exclusively for Black folks mm -hmm. to manage trauma dealing from dealing with uh, from daily racial indignities. So that's a way for the emotional Black voice to be heard rather than suppressed. And so it's a way to let that suffering speak. But then simultaneously, there's the Being the Digital Griot uh, decolonization workshops, which are open to all and kind of centers bell hooks theory of the capitalist imperialist white supremacist patriarchy, mm -hmm. which allows you to, which creates like a prism for you to think about power, privilege and truth from various different positionalities. Yeah. And um, it creates this space where everyone can speak about their truth from their positionality, but collectively we can meet each other where we are and perhaps get to some kind of maturation of the soul. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I, I do think I have a certain responsibility, but I don't necessarily think of it as truth telling um, because I, I don't want it to be this sort of like prescriptive thing of me like trying to tell people what to think, but more so mm -hmm. trying to like draw the connections um, so that they can sort of arrive where I have. And so I do think making work that is, you know, like consumed by people that are of all backgrounds and, you know, aren't art professionals, you know, things that are seen publicly, I, I do think there's a sort of responsibility um, for like that to be at stake in the work, you know? Um, but again, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would necessarily call it truth telling, but maybe like, I don't know. It 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 brings forth the truth maybe from the viewer rather mm -hmm. than like telling them what it is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I I'm gonna stay in formation. Don't know about <laughs> truth teller. Go um, for it. And I I do think a lot about what like if I use the word truth, like what is the truth that I want to tell and like who is the audience for it? And I think sometimes mm, there's like a desire for artists to fix the ills of the world, right? right. Like I think when I think about my own practice, like I have a embedded specificity of like questions, ideas that I'm always going to be attached to and care about. Um, and those are like, I'm looking for spaces that allow that to come forth, right? And I think sometimes um, 
black folks, uh, uh, like folks of color, queer folks are like, come in and like help us tell us <laughs> mm-hmm. what is wrong. And I think sometimes, not me per se, but there are <laughs> artists, right, who are like, I want to make light and space work. I want to make yeah. pretty flowers. And I, I like the idea that... Um, that hopefully there are structural changes that happen so that oppressed people might busy themselves with like the work of whatever it is that they are seeking to like shed light on or bring truth to. Um, and that, that I imagine that as a collective effort, I guess is more my point. And like maybe that mm-hmm. is part of my work in the world, but is that a part of, is that always a part of the work of the object? Is that always a part of the work of, what drives me to the studio? Right, and that's like a that's a larger question, maybe for for, for myself and for a viewer of an object, mm-hmm. and like what we intend or expect for an object to do, and is that always what it does? Absolutely. But yeah, that's my my thought that I'm I'm working through as much as I'm like answering the question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I welcome working through the question as you answer it. Um, yeah, I, I asked that question because I think a lot about um, the pressure that is placed on artists to carry that weight. Um, and I also think about artists who like have very consciously carried that weight, like folks like Afro Cobra in Chicago, for example, who were like very explicitly political and like very much were like, it is our duty as artists to be carrying this, right? Um, but I see both sides of that coin. So that's why I was wanting, wondering what you all thought about that. Um, related to what you were just saying, Diedrich, about sort of having the freedom to explore ideas without carrying that, I am wondering ex- about examples where you face challenges to sort of exploring your own ideas or freedom of expression within your own work, practice, the market, etc. cetera. Um, and that question applies to all of you. So you can jump in wherever. I mean, I think I think that the 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 unspoken like entity, right, is like the art world. Like we we're yeah. like, how do you think about truth? But like the questions, it becomes sort of like, how does the art market, art world, impede your <laughs> journey as an artist? How does it complicate you, it? you being um, productive in the world? Mm-hmm. Um, and like, how is the art world? complicit with capitalism and do we like put a veil over it and pretend that our world is like I don't know this please utopic don't. like <laughs> safe space unmask it please um wait ask me the question again <laughs> you were getting you were answering it already actually but the question is um can you share a bit about moments in your practice in your career in your work where you have faced sort of threats sure, to your freedom of expression basically sure. yeah um Mm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think in in part it is like I think it's a, you have you build an audience that gets comfortable with you making a thing that says says X or does mm-hmm. X, um, and then like how having to navigate not giving people that thing. Um, mm. I think it's something that I encounter often where like someone's like, oh, we want to do this thing. We want to have this conversation. Um, and we want you to talk about that thing you did in 2018, like explicitly. Right. Um, and so I think there have been times where I've had to be responsible to a truth that I have shared Mm-hmm. in perpetuity where then I'm like well actually I've grown past that and I have new ideas and mm-hmm. um, I'm critical of myself from then mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it's I think that's a hard thing to navigate uh, where artists become mm, thought leaders maybe mm-hmm. and and then I'm like yes I am responsible to to what I have said but also there is this new kernel of something that's developing that I prefer to share mm-hmm. um and yeah I don't know I think that that is a hard thing has been a hard thing to navigate between myself and an institution myself and a curator mm-hmm. um uh but I, yeah I think there's a lot of staking your ground and like pushing back and yeah. making the art you feel dedicated to. Mm-hmm. 
making space for evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would I would say I've I've experienced something where I say something or make a work about something at a time where it feels very like potent to what's happening, and then it sort of doesn't have it doesn't feel like it has that same potency like you know after the fact and I think part of it maybe is like um, the way that things sort of tend to consume their own critique you know and thinking particularly about like institutions where you're sort of like maybe raising alarms about a certain concern and then <clears throat> they kind of like find ways to um, like, I don't know, like make programming about it. So it's like, <laughs> oh, we, we did something about it or something. But, right. but I think there's there's kind of this like process over time where I think what's at stake like shifts and changes. And so it's almost like maybe maybe what I said then like was the right thing, but now it doesn't feel like it's enough or something or mm. like I need to change the strategy that I'm using to address something. Makes sense. I think for me, it's been um, interacting with presenters who, you know, present like they are ready to have certain conversations. And then, you know, once you're like in with them and working with them, you mm -hmm. see um, that that's not possible. So like <clears throat> an instance that comes to mind is um, you're probably all familiar with a piece I do called Shade Compositions, right? Yeah. And so I, I was commissioned to do that piece in Graz, Austria, mm. you know, which is a very unusual place to do that piece, yeah. right? And so I knew I was like, okay, well, I want to work with folks in the um, refugee camps because that would offer me the most BIPOC folks for the piece. Right. And as I was kind of pushing to like cast there, there was like all of these kind of this just red tape that just kept being put in front of me of like, oh, well, you can't do this. They can't really work. You can't do this. And so like, um, for those of you that don't know, people who are in refugee camps, usually they're like waiting for their papers. And so oftentimes where they live, people will go to them and be like, oh, well, we're building this building or we're doing this thing. And, you know, there's this idea that if you go and you work for free, you're a good citizen. So that will kind of speed up your paperwork. Right. And so I was like, well, they can't get paid, but this they could be in this piece and it'd be a fun way for them to work. And it became more and more clear as I kept pushing that it was really about those people not being seen. Because a big part of that piece is about having these people be seen in this very dazzling and um, way. And so um, that was just one of many in, uh, instances where, you know, a presenter approaches me knowing what I do. But then once we get into the throes of, of making the thing happen, there's all of this kind of like uh, backtracking. And so that is very irritating. I can and imagine. I often come in contact with it. I get that. Yeah, I think as someone who works at an institution, obviously, um, there are the stated goals of the institution and then there's the execution of those goals. And a lot of times, the stated goals and the way institutions actually function are incompatible, which results in the situation where you cannot show up for an artist in the way you would like, or you cannot support a work in a way that is the most authentic to the project or the goals of the project, right? Um, I definitely brush up against this, even as a public programmer. So I feel you. Um, I will move on a little bit and I asked this question differently when I sent it to you all, but um, Rashad, I was actually watching your talk at Fog from 2020, and this is a long question, by the way, so bear with me, um, but you were discussing voguing as a form of resistance, and at one point you say, once your imagination is suppressed, you can't really self-actualize. Do you remember saying that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Um, I think that statement very succinctly um, gets at the sort of nefarious nature of recent legislation, um, such as House Bill 1557 in Florida. Uh, this is the Parental Rights and Education Act, also known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. And my question for all of you, actually, is what makes artists uniquely qualified to educate? 
especially in a time where there is suppression <coughs> of ideas, certain types of education, so certain types of texts, etc. I don't think that artists are inher inherently good educators. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, they can be. What I think, you know, art at its best involves, you know, a lot of uh, inquiry and, um, you know, a gesture towards some type of criticality or liberation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if it's an artist who's really centering that within their practice, then um, I think that makes for a good uh, educator. And I'm answering this question really within like the context of art, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I think that you can't really teach a person how to be an artist, but you can teach them how to be thoughtful and, and think critically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're able to sort of pair that with a strong sense of craft and whatever it is that you're doing, then maybe you can get at being like a good artist, even though as I say that, I'm really in the process of trying to get away from the binary of good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think that if you're, um, if you're a teacher that is centering that, then yeah, you can, you can teach people to think critically about their lives and that's, um, that makes them a good human. And mm -hmm. if they were to become an artist, maybe they'd become a, a good artist or whatever they would do, they would be good at it because mm -hmm. they would have that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I think of art having like definitely like an educational aspect, but I, I don't think of it like necessarily as education. Like obviously, you know, it's sort of an amalgam of many different, I don't know, practices that I think creates this other magic third thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's definitely an educational component to that. And I think it happens through the sort of like sensorial, visceral, you know, emotive mm -hmm. impact of the thing where, you know, it, it creates like maybe a, a epiphany or like a, a revelatory moment, you know, in someone experiencing a thing which um, can sort of like open up your perspective or, or get you to think critically or, um, yeah, I think like, raise your awareness to some place that it wasn't before. And I think <clears throat> that's kind of the power of art. Um, I think similar to what Rashad was saying, I don't know if like all artists are necessarily <laughs> educators or interested in that, but yeah. I think what is unique about the practice of art is its ability to have that like very sensory um, type of impact, you know, that goes beyond like a standard like educational framework of like information exchange. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the arts are the first to be attacked. Right. Because if you can get someone to start um, thinking freely, then they're less likely to be controlled, right? Absolutely. So I think that's kind of what mm -hmm. that bill is about. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, I mean, I'm... Uh, minutes away from entering into a classroom so I'm kind of like ah, what is what is, how do I teach mm -hmm. um, but I think as like someone with a textiles background so much of the the like teaching what is happening and what you are what I am tasked to evaluate on is uh, so related to the hand right like mm -hmm. uh, and so I think I, my mission is always to be like uh, building like great crafts people but then in the background I'm like what if you start thinking about this one thing you know I feel like it's, I'm always sort of like an agent of like mm -hmm. while you're learning how to hem what if we like read this like feminist text mm -hmm. or like what if I just assign like I put all of these queer and trans artists in my syllabus right yeah uh, so I think I'm always balancing uh, like how to like just take the latch off the box where you've already been thinking hopefully about these ideas and ills of the world and then as you're making things you figure out how to like couple them um so i think i'm it's always sort of like a skill as a pass through to ideas mm -hmm. right so like while your hands are moving hopefully you have the like space to like roam and think and um like how those things couple i'm like Ooh, let's, let's let's hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, but hopefully you build some skills that you can use in some some like 
way that is meaningful to you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I've been trying to make many people Marxists on the low, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this question comes up a lot when talking to young folks, young artists, young people in general. I get asked this question, even though I'm not an artist. I'm sure you get it. Um, how does one maintain or navigate having a creative practice, navigating the art world, but also maintain one's integrity? And what does that look like? It is a pickle, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think first you have to define what integrity means for you because that doesn't mean the same thing for everybody, right? I would have to agree. Yeah. So I think once you do that, then you can start to develop strategies for how to move in a way that is in alignment with those um, morals. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and that's, that's just going to be a different journey. I don't think there is like a, Oh, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a journey for every artist to go on themselves. Yeah. What strategies have worked for you? Wouldn't you like to know? I would like to know. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to know. Actually, and indeed, I uh, would. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing I've I've done is. Um, you know, you can't give them all away because then everybody knows they're going to be firm, on to I'm me. I'm a firm believer in black secrecy. So, like, you're, like, so. giving away <laughs> the, you know, but I will say you kind of almost have to be, well, this is important to me, you have to be kind of like a Robin Hood where you're kind of, like, you know, moving resource around so that you can make transgressive things happen. Yep. And so that might mean dealing with some shady characters, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but in the betterment of something you. else, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. All right, I hear you. We apologize later. Okay. Who wants to answer next? I don't want to answer. <laughs> no, I, I feel like I'm really still figuring this out, and so I feel like I'm, like, learning on the spot right now. <laughs> Um, I love when that happens. <laughs> no, I, I feel like I'm really, like, in in my practice at a point of, like, you know, trying to figure out how to, like, resource it in a way that, you know, allows me more time to make art, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. It is a pickle that's sort of ongoing. <clears throat> but I think there are certain things that I've, like, like, I think in this question of, like, how do you define integrity for yourself, like, trying to figure out what things are important to me. Like, um, for example, I've I've been like really reluctant to like hire like an assistant or something, mm. but I've but I've have noticed that I have started to like work with some friends of mine where I would like maybe hire them to work on like one project or something. But it's people I like really like. Like I really just want to hang out with them <laughs> and they're also really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want more of those types of relationships. And yeah. maybe maybe I don't necessarily want a more like traditional studio setup that's more like transactional. Like maybe I want to base it around some other model where it's like the types of relationships I want to have more of. So I think things like that where it's like, but you only really realize what you want because you're trying to do the thing the way it's supposed to be done and you're not able to do it because it doesn't feel good and so you're just stuck and then you end up doing something else that feels great and then, yeah. Cool. <laughs> not I mean, the I, This is a hard one. Um, I mean, I think some of it is, I feel like my sound's off. Mike? Is my, okay, there it there is. You go. I feel like some of it is, is like being in rigorous relationships with other arts workers, right? Like I think so much of what I learned early on was just by like showing up and thinking like, ah, this is like the way this business works apparently. And mm -hmm. then like telling people who would either confirm like, yeah, like that happens if you work with this person or you go to that place, right? And I, I think what I have learned in the aftermath of that is like telling people even before I know they have opportunities, like maybe that gallery, that gallery is terrible. I wouldn't even go see what they have on the walls, much less show there. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I think there are so many inside secrets that 
um, we keep to ourselves for fear of retribution or like yes. someone <clears throat> getting something that we don't think they should, right? That then we let them be in um, terrible positions. Um, and, and then I think they're just things you do in, at the beginning of a career where you don't know things or like mm -hmm. you go to the opening because you know they'll have drinks and food, right? Yeah. And then and like, you're broke. <laughs> you live in New York or whatever. Right, right, right. Yeah, but there. then that turns into like, Mm, I, I can, I'm like, I keep remembering where I am. Um, say what you gotta say. But you, the, but then I think you get into situations where you're like, I've been invited to go to the thing, and then you go to the thing, and they're like, we want something from you, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, how do we get our work for our auction? It becomes um, attractive, right? Then it's like, also don't, yeah, don't call me for your <laughs> auction benefit. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there are ways that like artists get leveraged as the first pin or the first domino to fall, the first card. Um, but it is not that, like, I don't know. I just, for me, it has become about how does this benefit, not just me, the artist, but like, how does this benefit artists? How, what happens if I continue like submitting to a practice that is exploitative mm -hmm. and like, how can I make it make sense to other people who are around me that, um, it's like not the opportunity to take because it's in front of you and or like you have to socialize other folks into understanding like where an artist's power might lie, like what is important, mm -hmm. um, how do we move in this world and make our work and like, ch you know, make change. Um, and like, yeah, I don't know. Every show is not the show to be in. Every yeah. place is not the place to go. Um, yeah. Et cetera. How would you answer that? Oh. Mm. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. That's juicy. Um, as the moderator, I was not expecting that. Well, I kind of expected that actually. Um, how do I maintain my integrity? Um, I or what's this? Because we you, you you asked me for a strategy. A strategy, yeah. So what's a strategy that you use? I think for me, I very much have developed the practice of understanding that. I work at a place, but I'm not the place. Mm -hmm. And my work in the world is very different from my job. Mm -hmm. And I try to, try to navigate both within and outside of the museum kind of similarly. Like I don't really have, um, I don't know if I'm necessarily good at having a public persona, like this is Devin Malone, mm -hmm. off stage too. <laughs> um, and I, in terms of strategy, I think I, do a bit of what you all are already talking about, which is sort of um, being in community and forming a practice of discernment there. You know what I mean? Like what Diedrich was just talking about. Um, like very much engaging in these sort of underground networks of communication about the nature of the world we navigate, right? Um, and that for me has been super helpful in navigating this whole thing and also not taking it personally because I don't think any of this is precious in the way that white supremacists culture might want me to, right? Um, and I'm not attached to it. And I think that's super helpful. So that's how I would answer that. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that's satisfying, Rashad. Um, ish. ish. <laughs> we, can talk, we can talk a little bit more we'll about talk it later. later. Yeah. Um, all right. I have to ask the technology question because um, several of you, two of you, uh, definitely work with AI and whatnot. Um, so both in America and globally, the use of AI and other forms of cutting edge technology have caused quite a stir in the art world and beyond. Um, Diedrich, your work employs the ancient technology of weaving, whereas American and Rashad have beautifully utilized these newer, perhaps more controversial forms in their work. I'd love for whoever would like to answer to share a bit about the possibilities of wor making work with and or against technology. Well, for me, um, I am, I just think that um, what we're in our fourth industrial revolution that has given us so many incredible uh, tools. And I think that, you know, if we were to use these tools, we can use them to do all these incredible things. I think that the criticism that we're often hearing around like AI is you know AI is gonna is is so bad and it's gonna kill us and this that and the third but mm -hmm. like 
AI is a is a um, so it's an umbrella term for um, a series of uh, disciplines that collectively can create a myriad of tools, right? And you have people that are creating these tools, but I think the real question is, what is the integrity? What is what are the morals of the people creating those tools? Mm -hmm. And then even if their morals are even positive, what is the integrity and the morals of the people using the tool? Right. When you just center the tool, it allows all the other problems to kind of hide. And mm -hmm. I think that's where the real conversation mm -hmm. um, is. You know, so like for instance, I was just in Sundance presenting Being, and um, you know that was a big conversation around like AI and its effect on film. And you know there is you know a lot of folks who you know who write, and you know their jobs are under siege, or at least they feel that way because of AI. And it's not the tool; it's really the habits of the habitat, because there is another dimension in which a screenwriter can write a film and that tool can be made available to them to ha actually help them or advance what they're doing. But if the habits of the habitat are, how can we get the most for the least, you're gonna get rid of the screenwriter and just have the tool. Right. And so um, I think that there is immense possibility in terms of what we can do with these tools, but we have to shift the way we are in the world. And that's mm -hmm. really what the Being Project is about in all these like decolonization workshops because it's sort of like, if we can use the tool to become that mirror to get us to start thinking critically about ourselves in the world, perhaps we can make um, better tools and um, use them in more uh, equitable ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. It's funny, in some ways I feel like a Luddite when it comes to like new technology. Like I'm like, uh, what do you call it, like a late adopter? <laughs> like, even though a lot of my work is about technology, mm -hmm. so people expect that I'm like on the cutting edge, but I'm actually like at a safe distance until it's like not that hype anymore. But <clears throat> but when you asked that question, I was like, oh, I, I haven't used any AI. I've made work about AI, yeah. but then I was like, actually, I did use AI once, like recently, and I <laughs> forgot. And I kind of wish I had the images, but... Um, I, I've been very like, you know, kind of skeptical of AI for all the familiar reasons um, and trying to think of, and also because like a lot of the artwork that's made with it is just like bad. So it's like, <laughs> um, yeah. how, to, how to make something kind of meaningful with this tool that's actually like extremely powerful, you know, and, and evolving very quickly. Um, and, and I was, I'm like, I've been working on this piece for a long time, which is like, um, basically I'm, I'm interested in Octavia Butler's family's uh, migration from Louisiana to California mm. um, <clears throat> before Octavia Butler was born. And she talks about this chicken farm that her grandmother had in the desert um, and that it burned down when she was a small child and she remembers being like carried out of it. and. Um, I got really interested in this kind of like structure of the chicken coop in the desert <clears throat> as like kind of exemplary of, you know, this moment of like place making or aspiration in their journey from Louisiana to California. Mm. Um, but there's no like image of that, of that chicken farm, you know, so, um, <clears throat> and like I'm, I'm building like a sculpture of it now, but just as sort of like a process thing. I was curious to sort of like image it. And so <clears throat> I started using Mid Journey, which is like an AI image generating software to like create images of what that could have looked like. And it felt, it felt like very kind of like the opposite of how a lot of AI is used, you know, because it's like this, this sort of like speculative space of like, you know, black imagination of what this thing could have been in a way that's also sort of reparative to this archive that doesn't exist. So I wanted to kind of like highlight those aspects of it, but also it wasn't really intended to be the work. It was more just like as a study, but then I really loved the images and so I feel like it's something else. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I mean, I, st I feel like my mic keeps going out. Um, I still have things to say about technology. <laughs> no, <I'm like> <laughs> oh, I mean, I think I, this is a common issue encountered with e even 
even weaving or like textiles, like people get so consumed in yeah. the surfaces. And I think it's the same question around, even though kind of like low tech by virtue, by the same virtue, um, in the tool, in the process, in sort of like the sort of textured surface. And I think often, um, like if all that people are excited about or upset about, right, is the is the the interface, is the tool, is the technique, mm-hmm. um, like that seems empty to me. And I, I totally. think this is always kind of the journey of a, of a weaver, a textile practitioner, is like how do you inject more? Is, is there more beyond the surface? Is there more beyond the process? Um, and how are you using the process to sort of augment um, like whatever it is that you want to to say, right? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh, it looks like we are running out of time. So um, I was going to loop back to the starting question and ask you all like what you would like American art to look like. Um, but we can we can discard it if you want. Do you want to answer that? Great. So. <clears throat> Um, we're going to move on to some audience questions. Please make sure your question is actually a question. Um, Damn. <laughs> we have issues with this. I'm just saying. I uh, love y'all, though. Um, and then folks in the live stream, if you have questions, we can also take some of those, too. Hi, thank you very much for all of your comments. They were very thought-provoking. I'm interested in hearing about experiences you've had with people, not professional artists, that are looking at your work and conversations you've had with them that have been meaningful or insightful for you. I'm, I'm thinking, maybe. <laughs> I've definitely had a lot of them. I'm trying to think of a good one. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of like a very specific instance, but there's been many times where that sort of happened unexpectedly, mm. but I can't think of a specific instance. Um, one that I've had often is, you know, for a long time I've been making work um, that uh, celebrates the black queer community. And um, I think once, uh, uh, often feedback that I get is like from the community in terms of like the importance of me making that work. And um, you know, sometimes when you're doing it, it can feel, you know, thankless and I'm not doing it for any kind of thank you, but like it's really nice when you're speaking to a very particular audience and that's reflected back to you that they hear you and they really appreciate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of get DMs and stuff like that all the time that are really encouraging. Yeah. I I thought of a sort of, like sort of an answer to your question, Um, but it was when I I did this show at Red Cat, the one that you mentioned, um, one of the pieces is, this reference to this wall that's built in Octavia Butler's novel, Parable of the Sower. And it looks like a a cement wall, like pretty much every wall across Los Angeles, um, but it's inside of a gallery. Mm -hmm. And I remember like bringing my aunt to the show and like she comes in, like she comes around the corner and like she sees like the big cement wall and she's like, and like, mind you, we've been working on this for mad long. Like, it's not a real wall. Like, it looks super real, and it took forever. And she sees it. And she's like, "Oh, they haven't finished building the gallery yet." <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. And my my heart sank, and I'm like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> mm-hmm. Art is subjective, you know. Uh, I, I would say it's like there was. Um, I had an exhibition in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we had like a, a public program very similar to this. And at the end, uh, someone asked a question. It was about 
textiles or something. There were like many moments in this conversation, but someone asked a question. And then many of the people in the audience were like, oh, we know about weaving. Like we understand quilting. Like there's such a rich history of this here. So like there was a, a kinship both on terms of like, there's so much process stuff I don't have to sort of like set up and explain to the audience. But then like three black women who could have been my mother or like grandmother in some instances were like arguing with each other about like what the work meant. And I think I sometimes go into a room and I'm like, I'm talking about textiles and black queer this and this and this. And I, I imagine that the audience is immediately like, oof, I don't wanna do this. But they were like, we got to like arguing about like, no, there's Matisse references in the work that you're missing. And I was just like, I'm just sitting here chilling. Like this is, <laughs> this like belongs to y'all. And I think mm -hmm. they're, that's like always really humbling when mm. like someone else takes ownership of like my work and sees themselves in it and sees like it's like importance to things that, that I think about all the time, but yeah. um, that resonate with, with someone else. And I've had that happen where I walk into a room of like 60 year old white ladies in a textile guild and they're like, no, we like, we really want to be here. We have things to say about this. Mm -hmm. It always like humbles me. That's beautiful. Other questions? Somebody bring a mic over here. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Oh, one right here. Okay. The, this, this question let's, let's get was like Mildred the first question. Actually. Oh, was it? Let's make yeah. sure Mildred gets a mic. You can go first. Thank you all for your brilliance and, and talking about the creative process. Um, when you think of yourself as artists, do you think of yourself as American artists? <laughs> America's really big, you know. Mm -hmm. It's North America, which is part of Mexico and Canada, Alaska, Caribbean, and South America. So how do you see yourself within that context? And it's the United States. So how do you see yourself within that context? American artist? <laughs> yeah, I I definitely don't look at it look at it as like rep like representative of or a stand in for everything or something like that, but more that um, more of like a, a subject of all of it and I think <clears throat> like yeah I remember like doing like my DNA tests and kind of like seeing like I don't know seeing the division of like you know like primarily West African but like some European some like like Iberian Peninsula like Spanish I'm like um, Native American and like kind of yeah I don't know feeling like all of the sort of like historical things that happened prior to my existing kind of like mm -hmm. in my face, you know, and kind of thinking like all of those conflicts and resolutions or whatever sort of like continuing to play out within me, like mm -hmm. biologically, I think was kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, that's, I guess that's one way I think about it. I feel like it's a, it's a pot on the stove that's simmering. Like, I gotta keep an eye, when it, when it boils over, I gotta like go over there and tend to it. It's a book on the shelf that I'm like, let me, what was that line? I gotta read it. But I don't, I feel like I'm looking in on it. I'm like picking out the things I need. I, I think for a long time and less and less, the further away I feel like I get in time, I was a Southern artist. I was like an artist from Texas. Like there are all these specificities of a black artist. Um, that I don't, I don't know that they any of it like inherently motivates me in the studio, but it does like prompt questions that help me get into the work. Yeah, I kind of struggle with it a little bit because you know it's kind of hard to have that kind of um, sense of uh, national pride yeah. as a black person in America, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, the more I travel and like am in, in, in different places and interacting with other artists, I realize how much of an American artist I am because there's so many um, conversations and so many um, experiences and like uh, so much cultural production that I reference and that I, I find really generative that are, you know, quintessentially American. And so, um, 
yeah, so that's that's how I I deal with it. But I'm striving to be just an artist, you know. And I think you know, an artist's career is a long time, you know. And so you know, that's how I feel now. Maybe in twenty. 30 years, I'll feel different. Mm. Yeah. One, is this the last one, or do we have time? Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for being here. My question has an extremely long uh, preamble, so bear with me. But um, I guess, like, when I consider especially um, BIPOC being creative, I think of, like, all of the materials that we're born into that we kind of spoke of, right, or, like, touched upon. I think of, like, personal experience, I think of, um, I guess, like oral history from friends, family, your people at large, diaspora, country of origin, all these different things. And then on top of that, there's like varied and shared um, oppressive obstacles, um, larger legacies that like in your case, like black creatives have left before you, all these things that you can build upon or reference or be guided by. Um, all these things that you're born into, right? Like whether you like it or not. And then next to that, you have all of the methods and mediums at your disposal. Like I think of, um, as we said, like historically rich analog craft, like textiles and weaving or tech, which has endless possibilities and is always evolving and has endless pitfalls as well as like really, um, like I said, beautiful possibilities, anything like that. I guess when I personally consider art making at this point in my life, I consider like having to synthesize all of those things in order to build like your personal, um, I guess like both sonic and visual language and your practice and your style. Um, can you at all like speak to that synthesization or maybe like what is liberating or suffocating about that process? Mm. Um, I find it, I, I guess, like, what is not liberating but really kind of exciting in terms of, like, being in the process of making is um, the process of discovery when you bring things together, you know? And a big part of my practice, you know, when I said I'm thinking about the relationship between black experience and collage, I feel like the the gesture of collage is so rooted in black experience. Like to kind of figure out what black is when there was no definition for that before, you have to kind of put things together to construct this thing, right? And so, you know, I'm from New Orleans originally. And so like I almost see the work like a gumbo and I keep like adding to it. And then sometimes you I'll add things to it and then you discover these connections between the things that you hadn't really anticipated. And then that sends you now you're on that train. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're adding so the, it's really generative working that way. I think um maybe some of the things that get challenging is, uh, I think it comes back to, you know, the presenters, right? Whether that be like a gallery, a museum, a festival, a theater, or whatever, is like how to um, make sure that the people that are presenting your work really understand your work and the needs for the work. Because I feel like my work has very unique needs because I'm not a person who just makes objects. I'm often making work that involves large groups of people, often people who are completely not regarded as important within you know, institutions, mm -hmm. you know, e even like this one. Yeah. And so um, there's a massive amount of care that I have to kind of take on when I'm making that work to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part that becomes challenging. Like the making of the work is super exciting and generative. It's when it becomes to like the presentation where like the obstacles um, start to kind of show up. Mm. Yeah. Um, I would say even uh, not everything works. Like to your question, like I, I sense and I, I feel myself like there's frustration, like uh, the synthesizing that you're talking about. I think happens through trial and error. There's things sitting in the studio where I'm like, I know there's something there. I love this thing. I know it's still weird. I gotta work it out. Like, I think there is a lot of pressure to go from sort of 
ideation to completion, and there's so much space in the middle, I think, that we don't um, want to hear, hear about or think about, and I think it takes a while is, is like my answer to what you're asking. Um, and some of that is just like, I made a thing that didn't see the light of day that I don't believe in, and I made a thing that saw the light of day, and I, like, I have to live <laughs> with the fact that it is now out there in the world. Um, so I think there is a lot of like care and attention that goes into sharpening your ideas and your objects and all of these things that you you have to be the person to like make the call on what the stakes are like how do I know it is finished what are the the ways that I know this object is succeeding or pushing me or like asking more from me than what might be expected I would say it also takes time like it really takes a while to even like realize when the synthesis has happened like um because yeah i know that feeling of like feeling like too much is possible like there's there's just too many things i could be doing and they're all interesting um i think like <clears throat> in terms of like the time like i think of like when i when i was in school and i like didn't really know any contemporary artists and I was just, I just like wanted to know all of them and I didn't know any, any of them and I was so frustrated and it took a long time of just gradually like, you know, seeing people's names, seeing people's works and it's like now I feel like I have such a robust knowledge of what's going on but it, it really was like a very gradual process. Um, and I think as far as like knowing what is and isn't for you and all of those things that you consider doing. Um, I feel like <clears throat> there is kind of, at least for me, I feel like there's a kind of like intuition of like, like I might, ha I might come up with a bunch of ideas, but they feel kind of lukewarm. And then there's one that I'm like really like excited about, um, almost like have a crush on it or something. Like it feels really like, it just like tickles something in my brain. And I'm <laughs> like, that's, that's the one. Um, and I think also like over years, like seeing myself kind of repeat gestures that I've done, like, oh, I'm accidentally returning to this thing I did. And that's also how I know like this is of me. Mm -hmm. And so at first it kind of feels like you don't really know who you are, what you're doing, but over time you'll sort of like look at that trail and kind of like understand like what what you are and, and how you fit uniquely into like all those possibilities. All right, I think we're out of time. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Please give these incredible artists a hearty round of applause. <laughs>